Great, let's get started. We have a lot of great content to cover today. So I'm Gretchen Rowe, um, and I'm one of the physicians and program director at Corwell Health's um, Hospice and Palliative Fellowship. And I'm excited to talk today about the withdrawal of advanced respiratory support and the approach to symptom management and interdisciplinary support. And with me, I bring members of our broader interdisciplinary team to help speak in their area of expertise uh, because we know it's not just about the medications, it's about the whole team and, and how we care for our patients and their families. So with me, I have Carisha, uh, sorry, Carissa um, Skydeman. She's one of our inpatient hospice nurses. I have Caitlin uh, Lavasser. She is one of our inpatient hospice social workers. Natasha Kaminsky, one of our chaplains. Sam Boltwright, one of our child life specialists, which her, she is, there's funding for her position. She works in the uh, in adult space, working with children or grandchildren of adults that are going through serious illness. And then we have April of Fosh Column, who is one of our music therapists. So they will be speaking throughout the lecture and we hope to have time at the end that you can think of questions you have for our team, um, discussion about your practices, because this is, definitely an art uh, um, and a variety of ways to approach um, this um, part of the care we provide. So hope to have time at the end for that. I have no disclosures. Some of our objectives today, we're gonna to discuss the preparation for withdrawal of respiratory support as well as acute symptom management. We'll review pharmacology of medications commonly used in withdrawal of respiratory support and the evidence-based approach to those PRN or as-needed opioid um, and uh, opioid dosing and infusion titration, as well as with the benzodiazepine. We're going to define different objective measures, um, such as the respiratory distress observation score and the clinical application. We'll uh, discuss the involvement of an interdisciplinary team during the process of withdrawal from advanced respiratory support as well. So we'll start with the case that we'll use throughout this um, talk today. So Cindy is a 42-year-old woman with stage four lung endocarcinoma with respiratory failure on a vent. She has two children, ages seven and 13, um, and she had previously discussed her wishes with her spouse and told them if she was ever in a situation where she would never live off a ventilator, it would be time to transition to comfort care. He shared this desire with the medical team who then started planning for transition to comfort care and vent withdrawal. Cindy's parents and two siblings are having a difficult time with this decision as they've been praying for a miracle. We have one sibling who lives in California where the rest of the family is living locally and planning to be at bedside um, at the time of vent removal. To begin, we're gonna start with talking about the medical management. So this is an article that was influential in changing how our institution managed comfort care medications. This article uh, discusses uh, how the University of Washington um, developed and implemented a comfort care order set uh, with opioid dosing that reflects the current pharmacologic principles uh, and expert recommendations that was published in 2017. They talked through three main problems that they found with the old order set, including little guidance to uh, clinicians and nurses as far as um, how to manage pain and other symptoms. Um, the old order set that they had, um, which is similar to ours, uh, allowed nurses to rapidly titrate the infusion. Um, and then there's also insu insufficient uh, collaboration between the nursing team and the ordering providers. So they developed in this um, study, a new uh, order set where nurses were able to follow protocol and were able to increase the infusion after eight hours when it reached steady state by a specific percentage. And after discussion with our pharmacy leadership and PNT committee, we cannot do that in Michigan due to some regulations, particularly in Michigan. We can't have nurses increase by a percentage per protocol. So therefore we went uh, out to create our own protocol, um, but using the principles and the pharmacokinetic um, information from this article. So, so similar to uh, what they found at our institution and many others that I've talked to, uh, what was happening is titration of opioid infusions uh, were managed by bedside nurse primarily with 
usually the orders were saying titrate to comfort. And so infusions could go from two milligrams an hour of morphine to 10 milligrams very quickly. There was not clear guidelines necessarily on how to increase um, or when to give the bolus versus increase the infusion. Um, oftentimes those opioid infusions were titrated every 60 minutes. And the as needed doses were spaced out every 30 to 60 minutes. And then we know that rapid titration of opioid infusions can increase that risk of opioid toxicity and opioid-induced hyperalgesia. So current practice is we have um, developed uh, a, a comfort cure order salt that um, uh, we started actually between 2018 and 2019 um, when we've developed this um, in our institution, and it, it incorporates this evidence-based approach. The infusions are ordered and managed by providers, physicians, and APPs with bolus dosing every 10 to 15 minutes for acute breakthrough symptoms. And the opioid infusions are titrated. Once we find the, the, do, the rate that is best for that patient, we um, titrate every eight hours um, if needed once it reaches steady state. Just a little bit about the pharmacology of opioids. Uh, given, uh, or sorry, opioid infusions should be titrated once steady state is reached. And that's similar how, to, how we titrate long-acting pain medications. And so um, a half-life times four to five is where you get your steady state. That's our calculation. So we, given all this data, um, given the half-life of opioids, it takes at least eight hours for an opioid infusion to reach steady state. And appropriate dosing and titration of that as needed PRN opioid is critical for that immediate symptom relief while we wait for that infusion to reach steady state. So a key point to keep in mind is that the titration of our opioid infusions, think of it similar to how we would titrate long acting opioids. And it just as just for fun, I did the math at one time. If we were titrating in that old way, the opioid infusion every one hour is similar to titrating our long-acting morphine every six hours, which we wouldn't do. And so similar to how, you know, if we were gonna start a long-acting, uh, we think about how much of the PRN opi opioid they use and we calculate um, and individualize to that patient um, what's the most appropriate long-acting dose. And similar is the, this is a similar philosophy to how we um, recommend um, picking your rate for your infusion and how you titrate it. Another article I wanna share, uh, this is new this year that uh, I found very helpful uh, and I'll, I've referenced it throughout this lecture is this uh, article from um, the journal Pain and Symptom Management published in August of uh, 2023 called Palliative Extubation and a Discussion of Practices and Considerations. Uh, they share in there that despite the prevalence of palliative extubations and the impact on patients and families, there's very limited literature on how to best approach that, this um, area of our work and highly variable practices, even within the same institution. And sometimes this comes from a fear of deliberately hastening death and under treatment of symptoms. That not, may not be with hospice and palliative providers, but there's a lot of hospitalists or intensive care unit um, providers who are managing um, palliative extubations as well. So this article um, I will reference when I talk about um, other methods that may be used um, in, in clinical practice just to be aware of. So I'm not going to go through our whole comfort cure order set, but give you a snapshot of like one of the orders. Uh, to see the detail that we put in there. So when we were developing our uh, comfort cure order set, um, we wanted to put as much guidance and information within the order set so that if someone who's not trained in our field was gonna start comfort care measures, they would have some guidance as to best practice as much as possible. So um, some highlights for this is that um, we have, uh, you'll see we're starting with the infusion, uh, we have, written in the comments that we consider titration after eight hours um, if symptoms are not well controlled. Um, and so that's sort of that reminder that we that we wait and not titrate every hour, whatever someone may want to do. For the bolus, we always recommend, especially when we're trying to figure out what 
dose is helpful and make the patient comfortable, having a two, two uh, doses, a lower or a higher dose available. Because uh, we're a lot of times we're just picking a dose to start that we think may be the best, and we oftentimes are adjusting that, um, especially over those first um, couple hours. So, and we have them dosing every 10 minutes when we're coming off of respiratory support because we need to, um, we're trying to uh, stay on top of it and we can, it reaches its peak analgesic effect at that time. So I wanna now talk about the power hour. This is a term that we've developed. Um, and some of that was because we wanted to, when we were trying to change the culture at an institution, we wanted to show the importance of that that first hour after any type of symptom crisis. It could be a pain crisis on the floor. It could be withdrawal off of respiratory support. There's intensive needs similar to other patients in the hospital who are having acute chest pain or other needs. It needs support, whether it's bedside nursing support, our team if uh, we have hospitals or palliative available, but it takes time and should be a high priority. So that's where we have that term. And what it is, is this is the first hour, again, after that symptom crisis or removal of respiratory support. This is the time where we're doing the dose finding. We're trying to figure out how much opioid or, and benzodiazepine in many cases it took to make the patient um, comfortable. And we do two things. If they're on an opioid, which should be a primary or key medication in these scenarios, that we take how much, um, they use in that first hour of that opioid and divide by four. And where did I get the number four? So um, we thought that if the duration of many opioids IV can last up to four hours, then we take that all that probably stack dosing. And instead of saying, okay, I use 20 milligrams. So my drip rate is going to be, um, it's going to be a 20 milligram an hour. No, that's not, that's going to be too much for that patient. We take all of that and divide by four, thinking um, if it could last up to four hours, divide by four to get an estimated hourly rate. And so we tried this out. We've been using this process for six years now and it's found to be very effective. Do we go exactly by these calculations? No. Sometimes we're like, oh, that seems like too much or too little. And we just individualize for the patient. But it gives us a rough calculated estimate about what their needs may be. And we found that when we use these calculations, that once we get through that hour, really that initial drip rate doesn't really matter because it's not helping the patient. But once we figure out our calculation after that hour, after coming off a of respiratory support, we stick with that for eight hours if possible. And oftentimes we're not needing to make, you know, patients are well controlled throughout that time. For our benzodiazepine, which we uh, prefer uh, ben, uh, midazolam, and I'll share more about that later, or the why, is we, uh, it has a shorter duration of action. So instead of dividing by four, we divide by two to give our estimated infusion rate. If it's, uh, sometimes I find that that calculation could be too, a little too high if we're using it too often. Sometimes we're pairing that benzo and the opioid with all our bolses when it's maybe we just need more of the opioid. So I, we put all that into uh, play when we're figuring out what that infusion rate should be. So other methods, I want you to know that's something that we've developed, we found very effective. Um, and so we've been doing that for about six years. Other methods that are mentioned in the literature in this review, uh, this review article I shared, talk about starting a continuous infusion at 50% of your bolus dose. Um, they mentioned if someone has two consecutive bolses within an hour, you can increase the infusion by 50 to 100%. Um, same with midazolam. It talks about you can receive a bolus of one to two times the hour infusion. Uh, they talk about propofol. It can be used as an alternative to benzodiazepines when they're um, in, ineffective. So my, some of my concerns about what's the which is what's in the literature is that uh, these and methods increase infusions by a percentage rather than a calculation. And if we think about how we uh, increase our long acting opioids, we do them not by a percentage but by a calculation. So uh, I think this has been an effective way. Uh, so that's 
um, well, I just wanted to share what we have found effective, but I know that there's other ways that others may be practicing that work really well, as, um, and we'd love to hear about them too at the end of this lecture. Um, the, the other thing that they mentioned in this article, that the literature does not support routine use of anticholinergics to prevent upper airway secretions. We know that this is still commonly used. It's just know that there's not a lot of good literature to support it. Maybe, if anything, some scheduled Romanol. In general, there's not a lot of great literature. Uh, there's also not great literature su to support, um, thank you, um, Lasix to prevent congestive heart failure um, post-extubation or methylprednisolone to prevent post-extubation stridor. So in these um, scenarios, who's doing what? We did have to provide this education to our hospital system because uh, the nurses were used to making those medication changes. The nursing staff assesses symptoms and utilizes those as needed um, medications, reaching out to the provider if the current dosing is not effective. So that means that we as providers need to be available and ready to um, adjust those opioid doses as needed quickly um, and adjust the opioid infusions once study state is reached. And we also uh, don't want to optimize our interdisciplinary support. So our goal is that this care is delivered in a way that's effective, safe, timely, and aligned with patient and family goals. We want to prevent and, prevent and alleviate any unnecessary suffering and optimize comfort as defined by the patient and family. So you may have heard there's two different ways of processes for coming off of any type of advanced respiratory support. There is a more immediate um, where you uh, give pre-medications, a benzodiazepine and opioid, um, 10 minutes prior to coming off of um, the ventilator, BiPAP, et cetera. And usually in this um, situation, the patient may be comfortable on that current uh, dose, but we know, uh, or on their medications, but we know we need a higher dose than their current opioids and benzos in order to be comfortable after we take off respiratory support. So we're estimating what their needs may be by a variety of factors. Uh, it could be uh, how their symptom control has been, the prior history of um, requiring um, opioids prior to this hospitalization. Um, and so there's a lot of factors that come into that. Their vent settings, are they in high vent settings versus low vent settings? And so we anticipate we have a dose and then we immediately extubate and then continue with as needed um, medications after that. There's also the process of a titrated uh, approach where the vent uh, is, is still pretty rapidly weaned within 10 to 30 minutes and going down by settings by half um, periodically over that time. And sometimes a little bit lower doses are used as you try to match the symptoms um, throughout that time. And if the patient becomes symptomatic, you can go back higher on the settings. I'd say in my experience, most of the time we do the immediate um, extubation. Um, we give a really good dose prior to coming off of the vents um, or BiPAP or high flow. And families tend to like that um, approach the best. Sometimes if someone wants to be alert and talk with their family, maybe in a high flow situation, we just may start with uh, more conservative dosing and just try to slowly um, go down still within that 30 minutes or so. Um, and, and match their symptoms. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about a, the, the respiratory distress observations uh, score. And this is an objective um, measure to uh, look at a patient's respiratory stress distress when they're unable to um, communicate that with you. This was developed by Megan Campbell at Wayne State University in 2008. And she had a study in 2010 that validated um, um, the, uh, to develop the reliability and validity of this scoring tool. So there's the different parameters you see in the left um, with a score between zero and two. So looking at heart rate, respiratory rate, restlessness, paradoxical breathing pattern, accessory muscle use, um, grunting at an expiration, nasal flaring, and a look of fear, which they give you some examples here. So um, actually, I just skipped this. I'm going to go back to the slide. I, I miss. I switched around my slides, so I will go back to that in a second. So the key points for the respiratory distress observation score is it's the only known validated tool to objectively assess dyspnea in patients who cannot self-report, has good inter-rater reliability, 
a score of greater than or equal to three signifies a need for palliation of respiratory distress. Um, it's intended for use in adults um, and possibly adolescents. Um, and so it can enhance your assessment. So it'd be something to, worth trying um, and implementing into your practice. Then I'm just gonna go back a slide. I wanted to show two some objective measures for pain, just to be aware of. Um, there's this behavioral pain scale that can be used in intubated patients, but I wanna um, turn your attention to the critical care pain observation tool, because this can be used in intubated or non-intubated patients. Um, so maybe uh, easier to use. Um, and this, and this um, a score of, of greater than or greater than two shows that there could be a sign of unacceptable uh, pain. So this gives us we have some subjective ways we try to measure, but these are objective ways to help with pain and dyspnea. So going back to case one, um, um, we want to talk about involvement of our interdisciplinary team. We, again, we have our four-year-old woman with her stage four lung cancer on the vent with young children, two different age groups. Um, Family's been praying for a miracle, and not all family is present in um, town. We know the importance. This I'm uh, preaching to the choir when this group knows the importance of interdisciplinary team support. We know that at, depending on where we're working, we may not have a robust inter inter interdisciplinary team. We may have a hospital chaplain, uh, hospital social workers. Um, a lot of times, um, our social workers and chaplains can be trained to do. Um, memory making and provide support to families. So um, hopefully some of the things that you'll hear about today um, may help you to advocate for um, more support funding for these positions at your institutions. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna now turn it over to uh, different members of our interdisciplinary team to talk about uh, their perspective and their expertise um, entering in some of these situations at end of life, particularly in the setting of coming off of advanced, advanced respiratory support. So we're gonna start with Carissa, um, one of our inpatient hospice nurses. Hello all. And I'd like to say, being having seen both ends of the fat pathway, we used to have um, people coming off respiratory support with titrating versus this. It does seem practically much more effective, much more um, measured, and um, feeling like families get that better perspective as well, just as a practical point. Uh, but the role as a nurse is really a lot of communication and uh, working with the bedside nurse to determine who's going to be doing the dosing because we can assist with that as well. Um, but setting the stage for family and meeting with them and asking, kind of making sure what they understand from the medical team as the goal right now and um, hearing from them, any concerns they have, prepping them for what um, is going to be taking place that day and making sure, asking them too, what their past experiences have been and making sure they have a voice to kind of um, express what they've been through in the past and what they're hoping for now. Um, once that is kind of set the stage is coordinating with the bedside nurse getting the medications prepared and ready from pharmacy, which um, obviously often takes more time than you would think, but making sure that we're getting things timely and ready so that when we're ready to go, we have our tools, we have a um, clear line of who's going to be doing what, and then prepping family for what it's going to look like, you know, what they may experience as at least um, who's going to be doing what for one thing, who's our roles are, what they'll see us doing, uh, what they may see the patient doing and why we're doing it, um, giving them um, information as they ask, as they need to know that we're giving these medications to make sure that their loved one is very comfortable, um, what I'm going to be watching for, and prepping them too for what they may see as we come off that support. We also always give them that option, you know, you have the option to be in the room the whole time, you have the option to go somewhere else for a bit, um, giving them those um, options again to do what they is comfortable for them, what they want. Some people want to be right at the bedside. Some um, do want that they like that option of being told they have an option to to go somewhere else. So, um, and then working very closely at that bedside or in on the dosing and who's going to be in the room. And of course, our physician and respiratory therapist. Um, once we do that power hours, we um, call it them talking with our doctor and getting um, our meds to a good steady state and 
staying with family for a bit of time and really watching the patient after we're off that support, making sure everybody's comfortable questions are answered, and then preparing them to that patient may pass very quickly. We're not always sure, um, but really talking with family through what we're seeing as we come off those supports. Thank you, Krissa. Advancing my side. So now we're gonna have Caitlin share with us uh, a little bit about her perspective. Hi everyone, I've got the um, sunrise coming in. So I apologize about the glare there. Again, my name is Caitlin. I'm one of the inpatient uh, social workers with the CoreWell team. I've been doing that almost six years. Um, I appreciate your time and attention to this important topic. Um, I I wanted to tell a little story that I was a community social worker and I actually got called in on call to do a what I call them a compassionate wean. And it changed my life and it, it drew me to this work, seeing how impactful this moment can be and how <clears throat> important it is, I think, to walk the family through this traumatic process. Um, Again, I, th I think when you have the interdisciplinary team, you're tag teaming off of each other. But I think the role of the social worker is to, one, I say kind of the logistic resource side. I think one of the most important things is determining who that decision maker is or who the decision makers are. That would either be with a legal medical durable power of attorney. Um, <clears throat> it might be a guardianship that needs to take place um, or has taken place in determining who that guardian is. And even if it is a guardian that is not a family member, I think what we try to do is be as respectful as possible also to that family and incorporating that family, maybe not in with the decisions, but um, including them as much appropriate for that certain situation. You know, for our case study, um, we would, even though there might be one formal decision maker, we want to make sure all feel comfortable, especially when you may be including parents and spouse um, in that decision. The other logistical things might be um, completing um, paperwork for family, FMLA, uh, letters to employers or school, resource finding. One of the biggest things we see is when patients are brought in from rural areas, their families are, are driving back and forth, and that is a financial burden on them if we can get them gas cards or, or any type of financial support. Um, the cultural considerations, and I think it's always important not to assume, ask questions, be curious, what is most important to you? How can we help to try to carry that through? Um, that kind of leads into one of my most favorite parts is asking them what's most important to them. I have filled out pet passes, you know, for pets to come and visit. Um, we've gotten small Christmas trees in order to celebrate Christmas. Um, we've, you know, we've had birthday parties. One of my favorite things to do uh, that I've done is, um, you know, grab little styrofoam cups. What was their favorite drink, right? Was it tea, Coke, Pepsi? And we all cheers to them. It's a great moment for families to be able to come together and uh, allow for that emotion to take place. Um, doing those important things can also help you with timing. I think one of the th things that we um, navigate through is helping families with the timing of these. It can be hard to just pick an arbitrary time. Um, oftentimes we see, well, you know, maybe next week, Thursday. And of course, some of us might be, okay, well, that's not going to be possible, right? We're thinking that in our head, um, whether it's because we're doing these aggressive supports for that a lot of time, or we are, um, we just need the, back in COVID days, we needed the ICU bed availability, right? And so if you help them to say, well, let's try to figure out that when, right? Let's do who's going to be here, where we're going to be what's going to happen and what's most important to you. And that is where we can transition into that. Once we have all those things completed, then we have our when. Um, and to piggyback off of Carissa with the prep, <clears throat> sometimes what my role is, is to try to simplify it down as, as simple terms as we can. Um, offering what is normal, what's normal going to see. You're gonna see some big breaths, you're gonna see some shallow breaths. All are normal and all are okay. 
our nurses will be reading their nonverbal signs and those reflexes that we still have to ensure that they're comfortable, um, prepping them for what they're going to see. Um, and I always think to myself, have I done the best job I can in helping them understand? Everybody may not understand depending on their you know, medical literacy, but have I done the best job I can do to help them understand um, why we're doing this and what's going to happen? Um, and then, of course, I think the other important part for the social work social worker or the social work team is acknowledging the emotional um, burden that that these decisions can can be. Um, and that's why I bring up the five stages of grief. When we meet with patients and families, they're going to be in one of these five stages. You may see all of the stages, you may see one. This is also determined by the caregivers that they have and the emotional support that they received as children. Um, you might see just that anger and that bargaining, that bargaining of, well, if we would have done this or if you would have done this, this wouldn't have happened. Those are always indicators to me that someone is either going through that process or stuck in that process based on their previous trauma history, their previous attachments, and their, their coping skills. Um, in thinking about this, I, I, I kept wanting to mention one of my first palliative care conferences I ever had, there was a rabbi there with purple hair, and I'll never forget her. And she told the old fable of there was a boy um, who was sent to his the grocery store by his mother, and he returned much later than expected. And he came in and she said, where were you? I was worried sick. And he said, oh, I stopped to help someone whose bike broke. And she said, well, you don't know anything about bikes. You know, how could you have helped him? And he said, no, but I do know how to sit with someone and cry. And that was so impactful to me because I think we enter into these moments where we, we want to fix, we want to console, we want to, um, you know, those tears sometimes make us uncomfortable. Or if we're doing multiple of these in a day, like we were in COVID, um, we get exhausted, but we have to remember that we're stepping into a very traumatic and critical moment for them. And allowing that emotion to take place is the best thing that we can do. I say to families all the time, they are worth every single one of your tears. Um, and we have to be comfortable in sitting with them in that, not offering those at least statements, well, at least you guys are here, or at least they got this time. We can turn those at least statements into thank yous. Thank you for being here with them. Thank you for giving them this really compassionate and courageous gift. Um, rather than the I, I'm sorry's, the thank yous can be also a good replacement. Thank you for allowing us to be here. Thank you for your trust. Um, it's very much an honor to go along this process with you. I wish we, I, uh, how, however, I wish we didn't have to, right? Acknowledging that you also wish that this hadn't happened to them. Um, one thing I'll, and I'll touch on this, you know, to, to finish up is that I think people often get stuck or your, your grief plays a trick on your brain, right? It's not the result that you wanted. So what did you do wrong? And so I like to acknowledge with families um, that sometimes we do more things to them than for them. And that this, this guilt that they feel um, is normal. It's part of that grieving process and talking them through that decision and why they made this decision and um, what are their biggest worries or fears, bringing those things up rather than keeping them hidden in the, in the subconscious. Um, and of course, while we do that assessment that tees us up for our bereavement team, we can see where that processing is happening, what barriers might be taking place in that processing of that grief. Um, are there complicated griefs? Are there, are there, many, <clears throat> are there many deaths that have happened in this family? Um, in terms of the case study that we're discussing, you know, this patient is a mother, is a daughter, is a spouse. Um, and so each one of those individuals might be going through a different grief process. And so we are quickly kind of assessing that and um, teeing up our bereavement team as, as much as we can. I think that's all I, I have here. Again, I just appreciate your, your time and your attention and um, look forward to questions if you have them at the end. Thank you so much, Caitlin. It's advancing um, site to uh, Natasha. Thank you, Gretchen. Well, 
kind of to piggyback on what all of our teammates have said so far, the role of the chaplain or the spiritual caregiver, and you know, if you are able to work on a team that has an embedded a chaplain or spiritual care provider on your team, that's wonderful. And if not, I hope you will loop them into this situation uh, or situations like this, whether the family or the patient has expressed explicit religiosity or not, because the chaplain really has a great piece of the puzzle in helping families and individuals and family units, whatever they may look like, looking at this scenario and saying, what is this mean? Where does this fit into the story of this individual's life who we're expecting to die maybe today? Where does it fit into the story of our family? And how does it change it? And, and what parts of the story are the same? And, you know, in this scenario, we hear, and I'm sure you've experienced this, um, family members who are hoping for a miracle. And usually that miracle means the person is going to make a full recovery and return back to the way they were before whatever incidents or circumstances brought us to the point we're at. And having a chaplain or a spiritual caregiver there to have that conversation, you know, what does it mean that maybe the miracle isn't going to look like that? Why have you been kind of wrestling through this and how have you been thinking about this and how can we think about it now in a way that doesn't um, completely destroy people because i think we probably all met people who when they have a tragedy it really changes the way they look at the world maybe it changes the way they look at their faith or their religion but it can also change their outlook on life and contribute to that complicated bereavement certainly and just a general unhealth in one's being uh, in a way that a devastation or a trauma can really do. So we want to have those conversations and kind of in the moment, some examining of if there are different ways, different words, different perspectives to look at this situation and not make it less sad or less dramatic, but maybe give it its proper place. Maybe give it uh, some meaning that they may not be able to see as easily without that little bit of TLC and guidance from our team members. Um, the other thing that can be really beautiful that can happen, whether a patient in their family unit is religious or not, is to have some kind of ritual where, especially if they're, you know, in this situation, there may be family members who are convinced that they're doing the right thing, and other family members who aren't sure or who are wondering what's going to happen, uh, we can talk with them about what meaning to ascribe to uh, kind of how things unfold. Many people will feel that if a person dies very quickly, that that is an affirmation they made the right decision, or if perhaps they don't die as quickly, that can feel like maybe we made the wrong decision and having some conversation ahead of time about, about that to kind of head off those uh, potential really difficult uh, interpretations before we get there, but also to have some time with everyone who loves this person, who is interested and who is invited to engage in a ritual, um, whether that is an overtly religious ritual where there are prayers or you might even have a Catholic priest involved in a, a very formalized sacrament, or it could be something as simple as, you know, let's everyone be in the room and say the things out loud that you love about this person that you're thankful for, that you will continue to have even after they're gone. Uh, it may be a prayer, it may be it's a blessing like that. Sometimes people use, uh, you know, they may want a fragrance, they may want an oil, they may want, you know, to each place their hand on that person's body, which is a really beautiful way to help people remember the human side. You know, I think we've all seen too that when someone's in a hospital bed and there's a lot of equipment and families may not touch that person as much and to really give them permission to touch that person and engage them and connect with them in that way, which is so powerful and to give them that permission. And then they often will experience that it's not as, it may be just as sad or even they may connect to the sorrow in a new way, but it's not as, scary to touch them as it might have seemed uh, 
in the events leading up to the point where we are now. You know, I think one of the other gifts of having a spiritual caregiver is they can also re-emphasize, you know, do you have any other questions? Uh, is there anything that has been explained to you that, you know, you want to ask again or you want to hear again? Because we know people in these situations can be really hard to take in that information and to really give people permission to ask again, hear it again, maybe hear it in different words and give people the best chance that we can to know what they want to know about what's going to happen next and experience that in a way that can mitigate a little bit of that trauma if we can ahead of time. Thank you so much, Natasha. Really appreciate you. Um, we have Sam Boltwright, uh, one of our child life specialists. Thanks, Gretchen. Hi, everyone. I um, I'm very happy to be here today and kind of talk uh, more about my role. So um, along the lines of what Caitlin and Natasha do, I provide more of that psychosocial support um, during end of life. And in this case, um, our patient has a seven and a 13 year old. And so that's when I'm consulted when patients have children of any age. Um, but, um, you know, the caregivers and other family members are deep in their own grief and it can be incredibly difficult to figure out or decide what to uh, talk to their children about, what to say. Um, and so that's kind of where I come in to help provide support and education to the families um, and also work with the kids and have those conversations alongside the family with them. Um, I have several resources I'll provide families, whether that's grief journals, um, books talking about death and dying. Um, I also, you know, developmentally, kids understanding of death is very, very different. And so in this case, her seven-year-old child and her 13-year-old child are going to have a very drastic, different understanding of what death means. And so, providing resources for the family that help explain that developmentally um, and kind of um, start to help those kids start to process the death of their mom. Um, I will also often, you know, be there to support any bedside visits if the family feels comfortable bringing their children in. Um, they often look to me like, tell us what to do. Are we supposed to bring them in? Is there a right or a wrong? And there's not. And so I'm just there to provide resources, like I said, education, my background and all of that, and then um, support them in their decision, whatever that may be. If they do decide to bring their children bedside, I'll help um, work with a bedside nurse to try and normalize that environment prior to them visiting, whether that's, you know, covering um, the patient up with a more normal, softer blanket, something like that. Um, I also encourage families to hang pictures up in the room and just try and make the hospital environment a little less sterile for those kids when they come in. Um, I also am able to provide some really special memory making items and um, a few of those things. I also, or I will do thumbprints on different items, um, little keychains or wooden hearts or journals, things like that. And then with parents with children, I am able to take a recording of their heartbeat. And um, I work with some music therapists at Helen DeVos that can put that heartbeat recording in a stuffed teddy bear for the patient's children to have, um, which families really, really enjoy and feels a really special thing. Um, and yeah, I, I know child life is not um, a resource available in most adult hospitals. Um, and so if not, I, you know, I reach out to my chaplains and social workers all the time to see if they could help with that memory making piece um, as well. Thank you, Sam. We appreciate you. Um, next we have April. Hi there. Um, thanks for your time today. Um, because some of you may not know, music therapy is the use of music as a tool 
to work towards therapeutic aims in cognitive, physical, social, emotional, or communicative domains. Um, it's performed by a bachelor's level therapist with the credential MTBC or music therapist board certified. Music has the potential to reach people in powerful ways as neural pathways for music listening and performance are different than for other skills. For example, um, individuals with dementia may be able to sing when they cannot speak um, or become more connected with their environment when music is presented. Music therapy is used with many populations and our hospice and palliative care program currently has four music therapists and we all work primarily in the community but may be called upon in the inpatient setting. There's also a music therapist that was recently hired at Butterworth to work in oncology and with heart transplant patients. So you can go to the next slide. Music therapy is used in medical settings for many reasons. Music affects us physiologically. You may know that from personal experience, it affects our heart rate and our breathing. Um, when we exercise, when we relax, music uh, sound is just connected to our body, body when we jump, um, when we hear a loud sound all of a sudden. And music impacts us psychologically. It impacts our emotions. It may trigger memories. And music is used as a tool to distract from pain. You can go to the next slide. So in circumstances such as in the case study that Dr. Rowe was describing, there are a few different ways music therapy is utilized. First, as procedural support during a ventilator removal. During this procedure, there are often very intense emotions when families are present. Um, and some unpleasant sounds, um, and music can distract from that. Um, music is played when, you know, those noises that may be difficult to hear and allow, it just allows for a more positive experience for a family when they're observing this. Music is also used when a patient is actively dying, both in the community and in, in patient settings. Music can be entrained with the patient's breathing to provide physical support and comfort. Uh, we perform live preferred music to allow the music to speak, asking families ahead of time if there are any special songs they would like to hear or sing at the end of life. Music provides emotional support for a family and a space, a safe space for grieving Sometimes a song allows someone to cry when they were having a difficult time doing so. We also work with patients and families to provide legacy projects. Um, voice and video recordings are something we do, um, both with and without music. And in these circumstances, it, if at all possible, it's best to refer patients as early as possible if they are still able to talk and want to be recorded. Um, there is evidence that this can really be helpful for a family after the patient has passed and um, just helpful in healing and bereavement. So um, we also do heartbeat recordings um, and sometimes we pair those heartbeats with the voice or video. Um, our heartbeat recordings are um, provide a tempo for the song that we put over the heartbeat. So we sometimes we perform the song over the heartbeat, just recording ourselves. And sometimes we use a recorded song, whatever the family or patient wants. And there are some um, really, there's a really neat documentary that's free online. Um, in the website that's on your screen. So if you're interested in more, you can go to that site. Thank you, Carol. I really appreciate our interdisciplinary team uh, members and just uh, what you shared today for us. 
Um, so we'll go back to the we'll finish off um, our time together. We'll talk through the case um, and what we did for medications. So um, the day prior to um, coming off the vent, if you have that luxury of time, we don't always, but sometimes we get called in last minute. Um, it's good to think about stopping in any supplemental IV fluids or tube feeds because that may increase the risk of um, secretions at end of life. You could, in these situations, consider scheduled um, glycopyrrolate, but we did say before there isn't a lot of great evidence for that either. Um, so in this situation, the patient was already on um, morphine and midazolam infusions. If someone is not on a midazolam infusion already, um, it's highly recommended so that you could rapidly give those boluses because um, if you have to go um, pull them out from the um, med room, get a second check and waste, and it just takes so much time. So having an infusion where you can bolus from the pump is the ideal in, in many of these uh, situations for removal from advanced respiratory support. So in preparation, other things that we're thinking about is uh, as our um, interdisciplinary team members said, good communication with the medical team, the bedside nurse, with the family. Um, a lot of this was already covered by our interdisciplinary team. Um, at deactivate ICD, stop paralytics at least two hours prior to event withdrawal. And there's ways you can check to see if it's completely worn off, adjusting code status. Um, sometimes propofol is continued on, usually it, it's I find that it's able to be weaned off if you have Versed and you've been using some boluses of that. But sometimes there's a chance that you may need to continue on um, some level of propofol. Um, a lot of times if they're on Presidex, I keep that on, but I also add on the midazolam and the opioid infusion. Um, in place, uh, ensure all monitors are turned off unless desired by family and um, place your extubation order. So in this case, um, uh, the patient had been receiving mo morphine boluses even prior to coming off the vent um, and had had several. So we realized that if it took four milligrams of morphine to be comfortable on the vent, then we'll need a higher dose prior to coming off the vent. So oftentimes I uh, consider almost doubling that dose. So our starting dose uh, that we estimated for this immediate vent removal process we did was eight milligrams every 10 minutes as needed was the order. With um, I usually have my second dose be at least 50% um, higher. So um, uh, if, if, and if it's at a lower dosing, maybe it's 100% change, but um, so 50 to 100%. So we did eight to 12 uh, for both um, dosing for morphine and midazolam, started uh, four milligrams um, of bolus um, um, 10 minutes prior, and there was a four to six range. So these are the calculations. So, um, and I'm sending the slides, you can all have them afterwards so you can relook at this because I know we wanted to be able to finish this case out and have time for questions. So um, in that one hour, that power hour, the patient had uh, two of the eight milligrams, two of the 12 milligrams for a total 40 milligrams of morphine in that hour. So this was someone who had, had, had a lot of symptoms that needed to be addressed. So this may be a higher dosing, but not all cases are like this, but I wanted to give you an example of this type of case. So 40 milligrams used in that hour stack doses, um, given our way we calculate is divide by four to get your estimated um, how much in addition to the current rate. So if someone's steady state already at morphine of two an hour, we're gonna add another 10 milligrams an hour onto that. If they weren't at steady state and you had just started the drip, you don't even have to how, you know, you just started at a low rate and just adjust now to 10 because that if you start at two milligram an hour just before you start the vent removal, they're not going to feel that. So you don't need to add that to your calculation. So we added, so now the new rate is 12 milligrams an hour with boluses of, we started the most effective bolus is 12. So I'm going to give a higher one above that 16. Um, so in case things get worse, we have somewhere higher to go. Midazolam four milligrams used twice, six milligrams used twice for a total of 20 milligrams. So um, given a shorter duration of action, we divide our estimate is divide the total use of um, midazolam, which would be um, 20 milligrams divided by two is additional 10 milligrams as well to the um, infusion. So it was already running at two. So now we have it at 12. And we adjust our boluses because the six is most effective and we have a higher dose available. 
So the conversion tip to know is that it's a two to one ratio of midazolam to lorazepam. So half a milligram of lorazepam is one milligram of midazolam in case you're trying to make you know, um, connections between those two. So over the next eight hours, we're just continuing at this new rate that we set, um, adjusting those bolus dosings if needed. I mean, sometimes if we're way off, we need to adjust it sooner. We adjust the bolses as needed by 25, 50, or 100% based on symptom severity, and then have good communication around that eight hour time to say, hey, do we need to increase that drip rate based on if they're using a lot of PRN or not? So um, based on the time, we don't really have time to go through this next case, but I'll send you the slides. You can go through it. It's a self-explanatory if you read through the slides, but just an example case of someone on BiPAP um, and someone who are just starting on, if you're coming on high flow or BiPAP, sometimes you add that Versed infusion, sometimes you're just doing as needed bolses of Versed. Um, I usually still like that Versed during that power hour because you can give it frequently um, um, with that short uh, duration of action um, and onset. And that's why it's preferred over Ativan in this, uh, this uh, first hour. Um, and so, yeah, and, and especially if you're on the floor um, versus an ICU, it's nice to have those uh, infusions running too, because then you can pull us from the pump and get the patients, uh, the medications they need. So you can review this um, and the handout I'll um, share that shows the calculations just for another case using fentanyl because this patient had renal failure. So um, we've just really talked throughout this lecture the importance of communication um, just prior to um, after that power hour and eight hours after. I have shared references and the takeaway points are thinking of opioids like that long acting medications and waiting till it's steady, they reach steady state before titration using that um, short acting opioids and benzodiazepines for your acute symptom management. The importance of interdisciplinary team support as well. And want to have time for any questions for any, any of us who presented today or any alternate ideas around how you practice. Well, thanks, uh, Gretchen. Uh, this is uh, just always a great talk, and I think it's really important work. And uh, just want to emphasize the intentionality of uh, moving from what we had done decades ago in terms of just flying by the seat of our pants to really looking at a very structured evidence-based approach, which is really applicable uh, to a really, really broad swath of, uh, of, of patient population. So I, I just appreciate the work you've done uh, in, in doing this uh, and putting this together. Uh, so uh, I, one just comment that had popped up in the chat that I just wanted to just, uh, uh, just uh, uh, emphasize, Fred uh, from the Northern Climes, as um, he continues to uh, uh, inspire us with his wisdom here, uh, even as in his retirement, but often he, he made the, the, the note here that um, to encourage storytelling in those moments at the bedside, uh, that the time is, uh, is a time of potential celebration, not just, uh, uh, just, not just the, uh, the, the sadness, the tragedy, the moment, uh, and that the, the tears and the celebration can, can come together. And I, I, I tend to like that idea of storytelling and bringing, of both uh, levity and the tears into the same environment. So uh, thanks for reminding us of that, Fred. I had, go ahead, Terry. I just had one question about doing terminal weans at home and whether or not this can be translated easily into the community, um, either for Corwell or maybe uh, Dr. Mulder, if you can comment on, on Faith Hospice. Um, but does this look different in patients with degenerative uh, neurologic conditions or neuromuscular conditions? Yeah, I can speak just from our, I used to, when I first did this lecture, I added how to do this at home and it just became too long of a lecture. We're happy to do any extra um, talking about this another time too, but we really apply the same principles. It takes a lot of coordination behind the scenes, uh, but really similar principles, similar medications, just yeah, every situation is different. Their goals and wishes are different, but we've had patients with ALS or any other circumstance that um, it's their time that they, um, they've they decided and we just individualize to that situation. 
Yeah, and I would just affirm that we have done uh, home vent withdrawals as well. And again, the principles are the same. Team approach is the same. The um, the math is the same. I think that's, that's the important thing is that uh, the use of the medications and how we use those uh, can certainly be easily done at home as well as at the bedside. I would I would suggest that the coordination and logistics uh, are are different, uh, uh, particularly if you're transitioning from someone who's on a bed at home. I'm sorry, in the hospital, and they want to die at home. Those logistics can be a little bit more challenging than someone who is, you know, uh, the ALS patient that's been on a vent at home for quite some time. Uh, the logistics of that are a little bit easier, but still requires a lot of coordination of the team. So to follow up on that, I guess I just wonder, are we putting in IVs to facilitate infusions always at home, or can these, these kinds of doses be done in sub-Q buttons, um, or even just uh, as needed? Uh, boluses, uh, typically. Well, I'll, I'll let Gretchen comment how they have done it. What we have done is if they have a line in place, we'll keep it. If it's a viable, uh, especially if it's a central uh, line, we will just kind of maintain that. Uh, but if they don't have a line in place or it's not uh, a, uh, an IV that can be sustained, then we just do, you know, the, uh, any of the opioids as well as uh, the benzos can be uh, delivered. So we do the same. Mm -hmm. Doses and doses are exactly the same. Yeah. Sub QZ yeah. right. Mm -hmm. And I believe um, morph morphine and many opioids are compatible to run in the same as um, midazolam. Correct. Just, just wind them together. I think it's already been said, but we are, I mean, this is applicable to pediatrics, right? And if you're just assuming that we're using weight based dosing. But the but that formulation basically applies to kids as well. Yeah, I would think so. I, yes. I, I've mm -hmm. not done a, a, a kid vent wean in decades, but we used to do similar approaches. And I, Brad's on the call there too; he can comment. But yeah, it, it certainly is applicable. Yeah, I agree. The math, the math shouldn't change. Um, uh, to, you know, depending on the age is it's a, a weight based dosing, as you mentioned. All right. Any other questions? If not, um, Gretchen, I'll let you give the screen back and then we'll transition to our case presentation for the day.